uh, akan menjadi uh, moderator pada hari ini. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera. Terima kasih atas kesediaan Bapak Ibu serta teman-teman mahasiswa uh, untuk meluangkan waktu hari ini uh, ikut mendengarkan uh, lecture dari Profesor Kitamura Yuto. Mudah-mudahan kita sehat Akan semua. Menjadi, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Mudah-mudahan kita semua sehat dan dapat beraktivitas menjalankan tugas dan kewajiban kita sehari-hari. Amin. Acara kita pada hari pada siang hari ini adalah mendengarkan kuliah umum dari yang terhormat Profesor Kitamura Yuto yang akan diikuti dengan sesi tanya jawab. Untuk mempersingkat waktu, mari kita membuka acara ini dengan mendengarkan sambutan dari Ibu Dr. Dia Madu Brang, PMSI, selaku Chief of Center for Japanese Studies, Universitas Indonesia. Saya persilahkan, Ibu Dia. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yuto Sensei, Indonesia Gode, Yaras Kedidasai. Selamat datang dan selamat siang kepada seluruh peserta kuliah umum Ambassador Rakyat series tahun ke-10, 2021-2022. Salam sehat dan salam sejahtera bagi kita semua. Pertama-tama, atas nama Pusat Studi Jepang Universitas Indonesia, kami mengucapkan terima kasih kepada seluruh peserta, pembicara, panitia, dan pihak kedutaan besar Jepang untuk Republik Indonesia. Karena kuliah umum Ambassadorial Lecture Series tahun ke-10 ini, hari ini akan diikuti oleh kurang lebih 500 peserta yang telah mendaftar. Bahwa sampai hari ini kami mendengar sekitar 730 peserta sudah mendaftar. Mudah-mudahan bisa hadir semua. Kami mengucapkan terima kasih kepada Profesor Kitamura Yuta sebagai pembicara terakhir pada The Ambassadorial Lecture Series tahun ke-10, 2021-2022. Terima kasih juga kepada Bapak Takahashi Yusuke, Wakil Duta Besar Bidang Pendidikan dan Kebudayaan Kedutaan Besar Jepang di Indonesia. Ibu Julian, Staf Kedutaan Besar Jepang. Kami juga mengucapkan terima kasih kepada Ibu Dr. Lea Santiar, selaku Ketua Pelaksana, Dr. Ruli Pasaribu, Susi Nataliwati MSI, Nisa SIP, Julius M. Julius M. Hum, dan Yara S. Hum. Acara yang terselenggara atas kerjasama Kedutaan Besar Jepang di Indonesia dan Pusat Studi Jepang UI ini merupakan kegiatan kerjasama kuliah umum yang dilaksanakan empat kali dalam setahun sejak tahun 2012 hingga sekarang. Semua kuliah diberikan oleh ekspatriat dari Jepang dan dari Indonesia dan bulan lalu, pada pertengahan Januari 2022, yang mulia Duta Besar Jepang untuk Republik Indonesia, Bapak Kanashiki Kenji memberikan kuliah umum dengan tema hubungan Jepang-Indonesia sebagai mitra strategis. Pembicara terakhir pada Ambassadorial Lecture Series hari ini, Profesor Kitamura Yuta, pakar pendidikan Jepang dari Universitas Tokyo, akan mempresentasikan tentang pendidikan Jepang di bawah pengaruh COVID-19. Dalam situasi pandemi COVID-19 ini, bagaimana Jepang tetap bisa mempertahankan kemampuan akademik atau kompetensinya untuk berinisiatif. Mereka bisa menemukan masalah dan membangun disiplin diri mereka. 
Mereka juga melakukan kerjasama dengan orang lain, dengan bangsa lain, bahkan dengan negara lain. Kami juga akan bertanya bagaimana orang Jepang dapat terus menyelaraskan kerjasama dengan kerjasama dengan orang lain ini. Kami juga bagaimana orang Jepang dapat terus menyelaraskan wacana global dan sebagai tantangan bagi semua negara. Seperti yang kita ketahui, pendidikan sekolah pada dasarnya sama. Kita melakukan dengan tujuan yang sama, dengan sistem pendidikan yang sama. 633 6 tahun pada SD, 3 tahun SMP dan 3 tahun SMA. Meskipun semua negara memiliki karakter dan tujuannya sendiri, tergantung pada karakteristik pendidikannya masing-masing. Pada kesempatan ini kita akan belajar Bagaimana pendidikan sekolah Jepang dapat membangun bangsa dan belajar dari belajar di sekolah tentang kemampuan akademik, etika, moral, dan memiliki manusia yang sehat. Mari kita mendengarkan presentasi pembicara kita hari ini. Semoga energi positif dari Profesor Kitamura bisa menjadikan model pendidikan bagi kita sesuai dengan kebutuhan negara kita. Terima kasih. Dia Madu Branti, Pusat Studi Jepang, Universitas Indonesia. Terima kasih, Bu Lea. Terima kasih saya ucapkan kepada Ibu Dia. Uh, next, I would like to invite Mr. Takahashi Yusuke from the Embassy of Japan in Indonesia. Uh, Mr. Takahashi, the time is yours. Oke, okay, uh, selamat siang semuanya. Uh, nama saya uh, Yusuke Takahashi, atas pendidikan dari Kedutaan Besar Jepang. Uh, terima kasih banyak atas berpartisipasi eh, hari ini. Saya senang sekali. Sekarang sudah ada 260 orang uh, dalam Zoom. Mungkin uh, oleh YouTube uh, ada beberapa orang lagi. Terima kasih banyak. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you very much uh, for Ibrea, Ibrea and staff member of the Center of Japanese Studies of uh, Indonesian University uh, for all the preparation for this event. The Embassy of Japan and the uh, University of Indonesia has been uh, conducting this ambassadorial lectures from 2012. So this is the 10th year of this uh, lecture that started. Uh, Actually, today's theme, education, it is our first time to uh, focusing on this theme in this 10 year history. Uh, Japanese education is said to be a, a very unique one uh, compared to the education system in other countries. Um, I think uh, understanding the uniqueness of the Japanese education uh, relates to the understanding of the uh, Japanese society itself. So uh, today's lecture is not only about the education, it's about the Japanese society itself. So um, I think uh, it is a very precious opportunity for everyone to understand uh, the broad view of the Japanese society. And we are very pleased to uh, have uh, Professor Kitamura in today's lecture. Thank you very much for your participation. Uh, Professor Kitamura is expert in a various field of education in Japan. Um, it is a very uh, precious time for uh, having uh, Professor Kitamura for two hours today. And uh, I believe there are a number of uh, people from Indonesia in the field of education uh, who is participating today. So please uh, take this opportunity to ask any question you have uh, uh, to Professor Kitamura. So thank you very much everyone for your participation and please enjoy these two hour lectures. Uh, terima kasih uh, kepada Mr. Takahashi. Thank you for your opening speech. Uh, berikutnya, uh, sebelum kita masuk kepada uh, materi utama kita pada hari ini, uh, saya ingin mengundang uh, para hadir sekalian untuk uh, sesi foto bersama. Uh, oleh karena itu, barangkali bagi yang bisa menyalakan kameranya, bisa menyalakan kameranya sebentar. Uh, saya lihat slide-nya sangat banyak, mungkin. Uh, Mas Yuli dan Mbak Yara bisa membantu uh, untuk memfoto, mengambil foto dari kami. 
sige wa ano uh, we will take a picture session so uh, maybe uh, participant who is still having the camera off maybe could uh, put on their camera uh, so we can have the photo session yoroshiko nagaishimas hi okay uh kalau begitu bapak ibu sekalian silakan kita mulai membuka kameranya di layar saya ada sebelah ah, sekarang menjadi 12 halaman ya jadi bapak ibu sekalian mungkin harus menahan senyumnya karena kita tidak tahu siapa yang ada di baris berapa ya baik sudah siap semuanya saya izin mulai dari halaman pertama satu dua Masuk ke halaman kedua, satu, dua, tiga. Halaman ketiga, tiga, satu, dua, tiga. Halaman keempat, bersiap-siap lagi. Satu, dua, tiga. Sekarang halaman kelima. Masih ada beberapa. Satu, dua, tiga. Halaman ke enam ya. Satu, dua, tiga. Halaman ketujuh di layar saya. Satu, dua, tiga. Halaman ke delapan. Masih ada. Saya mulai. Satu, dua, tiga. Halaman ke sembilan, mulai satu, dua, tiga. Halaman ke sepuluh, halaman ke sepuluh masih ada, saya mulai. Satu, dua, tiga. Halaman ke sebelas. Saya mulai satu, dua, tiga. Halaman terakhir. Saya mulai satu, dua, tiga. Uh, baik, Bapak Ibu sekalian sudah semua saya ambil. Uh, terima kasih banyak, saya kembalikan ke Bu Lian. Terima kasih uh, untuk partisipasi pada sesi foto bersama. Uh, Oke, okay, baiklah. Sebelum uh, masuk kepada uh, pembicaraan oleh Profesor Kitamura, saya akan memperkenalkan pembicara kita pada hari ini. I would like to introduce uh, Profesor Kitamura Yuto today uh, in Bahasa Indonesia. Profesor Kitamura menyelesaikan S1 di KU University pada tahun 1996 menyelesaikan S2 di University of California, LA, USA uh, pada tahun 1997 dan melanjutkan uh, uh, studinya dan mendapat memperoleh PhD dari universitas yang sama pada tahun 2000. Uh, spesialisasi beliau adalah Comparative Education, Emphasis in Educational Policy in Developing Countries, particularly in South Asia and Higher Education in Bangladesh. Uh, pengalaman kerja beliau adalah sejak 2021 hingga sekarang uh, di the Tokyo uh, the University of Tokyo pada Division of Curriculum Development Graduate School of Education. Sejak tahun 2017 hingga sekarang di Tokyo Metropolitan Government sebagai board member pada Board of Education. Sejak tahun 2015 hingga sekarang Uh, beliau menjabat sebagai associate member pada Science Council of Japan. 
dan tentunya masih banyak uh, deretan pengalaman dan uh, pekerja, pengalaman pekerjaan beliau yang mungkin dapat digali lebih lanjut dan lebih dalam melalui berbagai website. Uh, demikianlah perkenalan singkat mengenai Profesor Kitamura. Uh, untuk bersikat waktu, saya akan mempersilahkan uh, Profesor Kitamura untuk memulai presentasinya. I welcome Profesor Kitamura Yuto. Uh, the time is yours. Sasoku desga kita merasensi yoros panengai tashimas. Hai, terima kasih. Thank you. And uh, selamat siang. Uh, kenalkan, uh, my name is Yuto Kitamura. I'm sorry that the only uh, Bahasa Indonesia I know. Uh, there is another one. Uh, terima kasih, but that I will keep. I will reserve for the end. Okay. <laughs> and then thank you very much for uh, joining us today. And then. Before starting my lecture, I really like to express my sincere appreciation to the uh, Dr. Dia and her colleagues at the Center for Japanese Studies, University of Indonesia, and then also Mr. Takashi of the Japanese Embassy and his colleagues uh, for giving me this precious opportunity to talk about education in Japan today. And uh, I really like to uh, thank uh, all the participants to join today. And uh, despite your busy schedule, uh, I really appreciate uh, you know you are joining us today. And uh, I hope uh, I can share some of the information about Japanese education and then uh, you know uh, for your reference. So let me share my slide. Uh, okay. Okay. So let me start uh, uh, my lecture. And then uh, I think you have some instruction about the way to organize the, uh, this session. Uh, I think the participants can write the uh, question and comments in the chat box, right? And then uh, I will stop uh, uh, my lecture occasionally, you know, a uh, few times during the session and then try to respond to the uh, comments or questions, uh, you know. Uh, okay, so let me start. Uh, I put the, the title of my lecture today as Japanese education under the influence of COVID-19 and possibilities of promoting knowledge diplomacy to share our experiences. That this subtitle may sound a bit strange to you, but I will explain what this means. Okay, and uh, today I I really I truly appreciate uh, having this opportunity to talk about the Japanese education with my Indonesian friends. And I understand that Indonesia and Japan are very very close friends, and then uh, you know we have a very uh, good relationship between two countries, and we really like to learn each other you know and of course uh, uh, as a form of the official development assistance uh, we may be uh, helping uh, uh, the indonesia to develop your educational systems but at the same time you know we also like to learn from you uh, how to you know uh, respond to the changing needs and demands of the 21st century today we cannot uh, think uh, our education by ourselves alone. You know, we have to collaborate. That's the starting point and the bottom line of my lecture today. Uh, because uh, the things are changing so rapidly today, we really need to get new ideas to improve our education because education means so much. And I understand that many participants today are the educators and then who are involved in education so i don't really have to you know discuss uh, how important education is but i really would like to emphasize that you know we are really educating our future citizens and then uh, you know those uh, who will be uh, living in a very dynamically changing uh, society in the 21st century so we really need uh, uh, our next generation prepare for the future for their futures. So we really need to learn each other for the you know uh, new educational models we are seeking for. And in order to do this, uh, we have been promoting international cooperation to you know to learn about educational systems. In fact, uh, the educational borrowing 
This is a very important concept in the field of comparative education. Uh, educational borrowing is the, the concept to explain that, uh, you know, we, any society cannot uh, develop our system, educational system uh, by, our, uh, by ourselves alone. You know, we need to learn from each other. And actually, you know, Japan as well, we have borrowed, uh, you know, uh, for instance, you know, 150 years ago, when we started modernizing our society in Japan, we first borrowed the uh, educational administration system from France. And then we also learned quite a lot from Germany and then also some other Western countries. Then later on, after the Second World War, we really borrowed the systems from the US, including the, for instance, Board of Education system in order to democratize our educational system. So educational borrowing is happening you know, uh, in any society. And then you, in, Indonesia has been also, uh, I'm sure, borrowing you know, the various different educational ideas, systems uh, from the other countries. But then there is another concept I'd like to share with you, which is uh, called the educational lending. Educational lending often happens uh, as a form of the official development assistance. So like, you know, Japan has uh, uh, been working quite a lot with Indonesia uh, to help your country uh, develop your educational systems. And also we share some of the ideas. For instance, you know, lesson study is one of the ideas. Uh, some of the Indonesian colleagues have practiced uh, following the Japanese uh, models. So, this educational borrowing and lending can happen in many cases, but then what I really like to emphasize here is that uh, we should not force any other country or society to follow the model, okay? We share the ideas, you know, because they, you want to learn, okay? It's not something we force others to do, okay? That's the idea of the, uh, knowledge diplomacy, because we are not trying to, you know, uh, compete for having certain level of he hegemony, which means, you know, we try to influence other countries or other society, because that will end up as a cultural imperialism, which we don't want to do that. So here, I really like to share the, some concept of knowledge diplomacy. Okay. Knowledge diplomacy started use, being start, uh, used by the uh, political scientists for some time, but uh, they have a very limited uh, uh, meaning with this concept uh, by you know dealing with uh, uh, intellectual property rights. But last ten years, I and some of my colleagues, uh, uh, there is a uh, one scholar named Professor Jane Knight of the University of Toronto. She and I have been discussing about uh, this concept of knowledge diplomacy for last nearly ten years, and then. Uh, this is uh, the idea to share the, you know, uh, the concept to share the ideas and relating to the uh, knowledge, knowledge, okay? And then we have uh, four pillars of sharing through the promotion of knowledge diplomacy. So we try to share education, research, innovation, and culture, okay? And why we need to share? Because we like to promote the cross-cultural understanding between the countries. So because uh, that will uh, basically increase the, uh, you know, more peaceful world uh, in a sense, uh, in the regions, okay? And then for us, like as educators, we are really dealing with the knowledge because we, we acquire knowledge and we transfer our knowledge to next generations. And then we are all considered as knowledge diplomats. Okay, so what sort of diplomats we are? We try to teach and learn each other. Okay, so here's the idea of creating a learning community in the regions. So this is the concept I really wanted to share. So, but the, you know, this, in, this is a kind of overarching concept. So I will stop with this uh, kind of the abstract discussion here. Uh, here, okay, so I, I will not continue, okay, <laughs> because you may start wondering what this guy is talking about. <laughs> you know, I'm supposed to talk about educa education in Japan, but uh, 
in order to discuss about the Japanese education, I really wanted to share this, these concepts of the knowledge diplomacy and the cross-cultural understanding, because uh, I really wanted to make clear what the meaning of uh, sharing uh, our experiences uh, in the educational field of Japan with uh, my Indonesian colleagues and friends, because we want to promote more cross-cultural understanding between the countries, okay? So let me stop uh, uh, discussing about the concept here, and then let me start about talking about uh, uh, education in Japan, okay? So I assume, uh, I have been told that by the organizers that uh, uh, many of you, many of the audience uh, somehow, uh, uh, somehow know Little, at least a little about the Japanese education. So I will not really uh, explain all the details about the Japanese educational systems. But uh, what here today, what I really like to do is that I really like to discuss uh, what sort of philosophy we have in our education and then, you know, uh, what are the ideas behind, okay? So first of all, uh, in Japan, through the education, we have been trying to promote these three, uh, uh, try to highlight these three dimensions. One is academic ability, and then second is the mind, mind mindset, and then third one is the uh, healthy body, okay, physical fitness. Uh, because we have an idea that, uh, you know, through the education, we expect the people to uh, cultivate these three dimensions in a good balance. So it's not only about academic ability, but also the richness in mind and also healthy body. So these three have to be consolidated in order to uh, cultivate, we, we call, you know, uh, so-called competencies for living in Japan. This is a very important concept in Japanese school education today, the competencies for living, okay? So this, that's the reason why we see the school education so important. Of course, you know, if you take a look at the results of the OECD PISA, uh, the international test, Japanese students do quite good uh, in terms of the academic, their academic ability. But, uh, you know, we are, of course, you know, we, we are proud of that, but at the same time, that's not only what we consider important. We really, consider you know, cultivating the uh, good mindset as a citizen. So you know, we really put the importance of self-discipline or cooperation with others or kindness to others and so on and so forth, okay? Now also we want uh, uh, our kids to be healthy and physically fit in order to live you know, actively. However, as you are aware, you know, these second and third dimensions have been quite disrupted uh, due to the COVID-19 for the last two years. So that's what we have been concerning uh, quite a lot these days. I will discuss about the influence of COVID-19 later. So let me just continue about talking about uh, uh, the characteristics of education in Japan. So because we consider those three dimensions, the balance amongst those three dimensions, very important. So we are not only teaching the subjects, but uh, you know, we promote a lot of special activities, uh, which we call, you know, these special activities we call tokkatsu, uh, tokubetsu katsudo, the special activities, uh, which includes, uh, uh, for instance, school lunch or uh, uh, home rooms. Home room means, you know, there's class meetings to discuss about the daily issues among the classmates. Or uh, school cleanup, students clean the, uh, their classrooms by themselves. And so also we have many different special activities such as a sports festival and so on and so forth. But for instance, you know, why, why we consider these as important? For instance, you know, let me think of let me uh, lay the school lunch as a case, one of the examples. 
as this photo shows, you know, that everyone prepares for the lunch, you know, and then they serve. I mean, there is a small group of students uh, always, you know, uh, in charge of uh, feeding, you know, serving their foods to other students. And then this will be rotated, you know. So many cases in Japanese schools, students form a small team, like four to six students form one team and then they work together. So in order to have that school lunch, these students, a team of st students uh, uh, serve the lunch to other students. And then they enjoy eating together and then they clean up, okay? And this is, a, you know, as I put uh, here, like a cooperation with others, you know, we try to cultivate, uh, you know, that kind of mindset. Of course, also, you know, the school lunch is very, very important because uh, uh, we have, uh, we, each school has basically, each school has uh, nutrition and the experts in the, you know, nutritious issues. And then they actually calculate uh, how much calories, how much, you know, uh, dietary, uh, you know, how much, how, how students can have a, a good dietary food. So, we really consider the balance of the different types of food to serve every day, okay? And there's a, another uh, special activity such as, as I explained earlier, like uh, school cleanups, okay? And these sanitation and hygiene are quite important uh, in the Japanese education because uh, we want kids to learn to, you know, to be healthy, okay? And then, good uh, sanitation, I mean, you know, we want them to understand the issue of sanitation and hygiene. So one of the characteristics of Japanese schools is that uh, uh, you can find many, uh, you know, uh, water sinks in Japanese schools, you know, because students often require to wash their hands, okay? So when they go out classroom and they come back, they, they are supposed to wash their hands or when they go to the bathroom and then come back, you know, they should, they're supposed to wash. Every time, you know, they really wash. This is uh, quite, uh, uh, you know, common among the Japanese students. And then this kind of habit continues throughout their life. So, you know, once you get uh, used to uh, doing these, these things, you know, you, you will never forget. So for instance, we, con we of course, you know, Japan has been also suffering from the COVID-19 for the last two years. But at the same time, comparing to many other countries, probably the situation in Japan is relatively uh, better. And then one of the reasons can be found in this kind of practices relating to the hygiene and sanitation, okay? Because uh, people, people get used to, uh, you know, from the school ages. And if you are interested in this kind of, you know, uh, special activities we call tokats, uh, please, uh, you know, this is a book published by my colleagues uh, focusing on this type of Japanese educational model, uh, looking at the more holistic manner. So let me, uh, so what the sort of the uh, school education we have uh, I would like to share, I would like to show the uh, video created by the Ministry of Education of Japan. Okay, so let me show this video for some time. And then I hope you can have a better idea. Uh, this is a video. Uh, this one, okay. As I said, the created by the Japanese Ministry of Education and then uh, Introducing, you know, uh, what sort of uh, uh, introducing about the Japanese education. Okay. Can you listen? Are you okay? Okay, so let me continue. Okay, then we have a uh, Indonesian subtitles. So please enjoy watching. It's about six minutes. Dropout rate is very low at less than 1.5%. 
Japanese students also achieve scores in international student assessments that are significantly higher than the global average. On another note, the calm and disciplined behavior of the Japanese people in the face of terrible disasters has been highly lauded by many other countries. What kind of education can foster such traits and abilities in Japanese people? School education in Japan focuses on building overall character, exemplified by the concepts of chi, toku, kai, solid academic ability, richness and humanity, and a healthy body. This fact is widely recognized in Japanese society, and a distinguishing feature of education in Japan is society's high expectations for it. Each school conducts education by devising various measures for implementing its policies. Here, we introduce how elementary school children spend their days at a school in Japan. Children walk to school via a prescribed school route. Community residents watch over the children walking to school to ensure their safety and security. After arriving at school, the children spend their time as they wish until the daily morning meeting starts. The morning meeting begins with everyone giving their morning greetings under the direction of the Nichoku, or day leaders. The Nichoku are the leaders of the class for that day. The Nichoku support the teacher and MC meetings. The Nichoku change every day, with all the children in the class holding this role in turns. Following the morning meeting, the classes begin. Broad and well-balanced capabilities are cultivated through Japanese language, arithmetic, science, music, physical education, home economics, moral education, and other subjects. In the period for integrated studies, the learning environments that exist in the community are actively used in collaboration with the people of the community and partnerships with social education facilities, such as community centers, libraries, and museums. Classwork is carried out through a systematic combination of lessons given by teachers and group activity studies. After the morning classes end, it's lunchtime. The lunch menu is quite varied. A different menu is prepared each day to ensure a nutritional balance. Through the school lunch, the children gain proper knowledge about food and desirable eating habits from a diet and nutrition teacher. And because locally harvested ingredients are used for the lunches, they come to understand their region and carry on its food culture. As a general rule, Japanese school lunches are served by the children themselves. Children on lunch duty serve the lunches to their classmates. The lunch duty changes regularly so that all of the children in the class can take on this role. Following lunch is cleaning time. Cleaning is also done by the children themselves. They are assigned to shifts in certain areas. The children clean not only their classrooms, but also the hallways and lavatories. Duties, such as cleaning and committee activities, are also an established part of education. After the cleaning is recess, when the children can play to their heart's content. Some like to play energetically outdoors with their friends, and others spend their time reading books in the library. The children are also members of various committees, such as the library committee, which manages the loaning of books from the school library. The animal caretaker committee looks after the animals raised at the school. The school beautification works to keep the school clean. Through such activities, the children learn what they can do for the school, for others, and for themselves. The children are also active in club activities. There are sports-related clubs for those who like sports, such as soccer, baseball, and dance, as well as many indoor activity clubs, such as music, which includes playing wind instruments, theater, art, and computer clubs. Through such club activities, friendships that go beyond the framework of upper or lower grades are formed among the children. This helps each child to develop his or her individuality. Through school events, such as the Undokai, or annual sports day, music festival,
school recital and work experience. Children can form good human relationships and develop a voluntary and practical attitude for building better school life through cooperation. School events are not just about the event itself. The process of preparing for the event is also considered a valuable part of education. And these events are not just for the teachers and children, but they also attract people from the local community and family members, encouraging deeper interaction and providing an opportunity for families to see how much their children have grown. This was an introduction to a day at school for Japanese elementary school students. It's given you a brief glimpse of the elementary school education currently implemented in Japan. We hope it provided you with information that can contribute in some small way to your country's education system. If there's anything about Japanese education that you are interested in, please feel free to contact Itchport Japan. Okay, I hope you enjoyed. And this is a video uh, created uh, as a part of the project, uh, oh, sorry, a part of the project called the Edupot Japan, uh, which I will explain later uh, in a minute. And then I was involved in this project and then I was also involved in the, uh, creating this uh, video. So, <laughs> you know, uh, that's, a, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to share this with you. I mean, they spend a lot of time to create this video. But I, I think, you know, you could have a, a quite a, a basic understanding about the job, daily life of students in schools. By the way, uh, today my talk is more focusing on school, school education, so which means primary and secondary levels. Uh, and I don't prepare much for the higher education, but, uh, you know, if you have any question about higher education, you can also ask questions. And so now uh, I'd like to move on. I mean, this is uh, kind of the you know, brief introduction about Japanese education. And uh, today uh, we are trying to share uh, what we have been uh, doing in education sector of Japan for many years. So this is the uh, overseas development of Japanese style education. And Ministry of Education of Japan, we call MEXP. Uh, MEXT is very keen to do this. That's why they created the project called the Edupot Japan, because uh, we have been asked by many other countries to share our uh, knowledge uh, and the practice uh, and the experiences. So that's why, uh, you know, uh, the Japanese government is now quite keen to uh, share the information about the Japanese education. For instance, you know, one, one of the most popular uh, Japanese educational practice is uh, lesson study. You may have heard about lesson studies. You know, lesson study is the uh, long, uh, you know, standing practice among the Japanese teachers. Uh, actually, they started this practice uh, uh, more than 100 years ago, okay? Teachers watch uh, the, the class, of other teachers, and then they try to, you know, uh, give advices each other. And then this is the uh, the lesson study, and then you you, you know this is kind of a uh, this is a quite a big group, but uh, you know the lesson study is conducted in this way. You know, teachers observe how students are learning or how students are having trouble to learn, and then. This is not the occasion to criticize each other. In fact, uh, you know, the lesson study is to try to encourage other teachers and then give advice to improve. So the most important uh, uh, philosophy of the lesson study is to create and develop a sense of uh, collegialities, a sense of colleagues you know, among, the, among the teachers. So by observing this, uh, you know, other teachers lesson, you know, we can learn a lot as well. And this is quite unique because uh, as I understand uh, uh, many of you that, you know, today are somehow related, you know, engaged in uh, educational practices as a teachers or some other roles. Teachers uh, normally do not want uh, be observed 
by other 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 people because they feel like you know uh, often the case you know teachers feel uncomfortable being watched by others while they are teaching but uh, in case of japan you know teachers uh, got quite used to you know being watched by other teachers of course you know they feel uh, nervous as well but uh, you know at the same time they understand this is important to be observed by other teachers and then this lesson study has been practiced uh, in some parts in Indonesia and then some other countries in Southeast Asia, such as Vietnam, uh, Malaysia, Thailand. And then uh, nowadays we see uh, some practices in the United States and some other Western countries as well. So lesson study has been becoming uh, very uh, somewhat popular among the teachers who try to improve their lessons. So this is just one example, but the Japanese government wants to uh, share the you know, uh, Japanese style education with uh, our foreign partners. So that's why the ministry uh, launched the project called uh, Eduport Japan. Okay, the Eduport Japan has three objectives, you know. Uh, for instance, you know, uh, of course, you know, uh, for the, our partner countries, they want to improve their education by learning from Japanese uh, educational practices. But for on our side, you know, we also like to, you know, we have our, our objective because we want to, for instance, you know, uh, want our partners to know more about Japanese education. Then, you know, we have more friends. And also, you know, it's not only one way collaborations. By sharing our experiences, we ex expect uh, uh, both way, the interaction between the Japan and our partner countries to collaborate. So that may be able to uh, promote the internationalization of Japanese education. So what sort of project do we have today? I mean, I just uh, share with you uh, two examples. One is the uh, introduction of Japanese style education or musical instruments into primary and secondary schools. Uh, this is uh, uh, conducted by Yamaha Corporation. You know the Yamaha, which has been promote, producing you know, uh, musical instruments. Of course, they also uh, produce the motorcycles. <laughs> But uh, in this case, the music, musical instruments. And then they have conducted this project in Vietnam and Egypt. Because these countries, uh, uh, I assume some part of uh, Indonesia as well. I mean, you may not uh, have uh, enough uh, opportunities for students to play musical instruments in the school lessons. So, they actually uh, use, uh, you know, some of the musical instruments, uh, particularly this recorder. Uh, uh, this is uh, easy to play. So then it is quite interesting that the music teachers in Vietnam, for instance, you know, uh, never thought let the kids play musical instruments before. But then they, they thought, you know, it's probably too difficult for students to play, but actually it's not, you know, if you teach in a proper way, uh, it's not that difficult. Then, you know, teachers found uh, uh, quite uh, uh, amazing that how students enjoy the musical lessons. Then now the Vietnam has incorporated this uh, play of the musical instruments in the, their new national curriculum. So they have been nationally uh, recognizing the importance of introducing the uh, lesson of the musical instruments in Vietnam. Here's another example, for instance. Uh, this is more for the secondary level and the post-secondary. Secondary and post-secondary levels about the vocational training of auto mechanics. So this is again some company, Japanese company called the Giant Leap International uh, operate in Myanmar to uh, train the auto mechanic, uh, to introduce the auto mechanic training courses. And then this has been also, you know, uh, becoming a part of the Myanmar National Skills uh, 
uh, standard. So, for instance, you know, this kind of, this type of vocational training, you know, you, you probably have uh, quite uh, a lot uh, uh, in Indonesia. I have been, I mean, I mean, fascinated by the SMK you have developed and then also the vocational education in the higher education levels. So Indonesia has been having quite a good and long experience of uh, pro promoting the vocational training. And that may be some areas, Japan and Indonesia can collaborate. Uh, we haven't uh, seen much yet, but I hope that, you know, because uh, Jap in Japanese education system, vocational training uh, has been considered very important as well. So that sort of collaboration, I kind of expect between Indonesia and Japan. And then this Edipot project uh, for last five years, we have done uh, 66 pilot projects in 36 countries and regions. And there's so many teachers on both sides, both Japanese side and then partner side were involved in. So this kind of Edupot uh, Japan project, uh, I hope you know, we can also uh, promote uh, in Indonesia as well. Uh, if any Indonesian partner find uh, uh, this project interesting, uh, there is a space for us to collaborate. Okay, then uh, here I, you know, I have uh, introduced the, the characteristics of the Japanese education and then some of the very recent efforts of Japanese government to uh, share our educational experience with our foreign partners. And then last two years, we have been struggling with COVID-19. So uh, this is the main part of the, uh, today's uh, uh, session. So I'd like to move on to here, but if uh, there is any, question or comment so far. I'd like to ask uh, the organizers if uh, there's any comment or question you have found. If not, I will continue. Mother Sensei. Hmm? Mother Des. Mother Des, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. There's no question or comment. So I will continue. And I hope this is interesting to you. And let me continue, okay? Then uh, the last two years as uh, Indonesia as well, I mean, Japan has been struggling with this, uh, you know, COVID-19. And then we are now in the middle of the sixth wave of the uh, pandemic. And these are the, these are the, you know, last, last um, one month and a half, uh, we have been really observing the increase in number of people uh, affected by uh, COVID-19. And probably this, uh, uh, the process of uh, last process, how our schools uh, went through for the last two years, may be quite similar somewhat similar to Indonesian case. Uh, for instance, you know, when we first uh, uh, realized uh, a pandemic uh, in the February, 2020, uh, the society, society kind of, you know, became, we were so panicked in Japanese society. And then the Japanese government has decided uh, to close almost all the schools uh, for two and a half months, okay. And, but then, uh, so we closed the schools in March, uh, 2020. And then March is the end of the last month of the academic calendar in Japan. So many students who were about to graduate the schools uh, they couldn't, uh, you know, we couldn't celebrate the graduation ceremonies because, uh, you know, we closed the schools. And then when we welcomed new students in April 2020, again, we couldn't uh, organize, uh, you know, those kind of ceremonies to, because in Japan, we always have a big ceremonies for graduation and also the, you know, entrance of the schools, but we couldn't do that. So, uh, it depending on the situation of the COVID uh, in the different parts of Japan. So 
99% of schools closed, but a few schools remained open. And then uh, so some areas, they opened the schools earlier and then some closed longer. But uh, when we reached the June 2020, uh, most of the schools opened basically. So it was about two, two, two and a half months or less than three months we closed. So in many other Asian countries, uh, I know uh, you close uh, the schools uh, much longer time period, but uh, somehow uh, we could, uh, we, you know, we didn't have to close the schools uh, for so many months. Uh, of course, you know, three months are not short, but uh, comparing to many other uh, Asian countries, I think we could open our schools uh, uh, quite early, early stage. Because uh, I remember the statistics uh, released by UNESCO in June 2020. Uh, there were nearly 100, 190 countries and around the world somehow closed the schools. So almost all the countries somehow affected. And then Japan kind of recovered uh, somewhat uh, uh, faster than the, uh, many other countries. Okay. And June 2020, when we started, uh, uh, we opened the schools again. The next, the Ministry of Education uh, released the announcement, uh, which is the uh, you know, uh, it's called a comprehensive package for the assurance of learning for pupils and students to be implemented along with measures against the spread of the novel coronavirus. Okay, and then in this announcement, uh, they highlighted two issues. Uh, due to the closure of the schools, uh, you know, uh, we found the delays in learning. So normally the schools, particularly public schools in Japan, uh, we close Saturday and Sunday. However, in this case, you know, uh, schools were kind of encouraged to open on Saturdays to compensate the delay of the learning of, among the students. And then also uh, schools were asked to select uh, certain special activities uh, then try to prioritize which one is more important than the other others. So as you saw the video and uh, I explained earlier, in Japanese schools, we have many special activities such as, you know, sports event or music, musical events or, you know, cultural events. But uh, our, our, you know, schools often do the uh, treat, uh, school trips to go some other places to, but uh, you know, many schools decided not to do these uh, you know, special activities. This was pity because uh, you know, somehow in this, uh, this, at that moment, uh, the Japanese schools and the ministry tried to prioritize the academic learning uh, more than the special activities. And I understand that you know, because uh, there was a delay. So that's, that's uh, you know, that's a decision uh, you know we had to make, but uh, simply I regret uh, you know uh, students lost many opportunities for the special activities, and so and also you know the ministry uh, emphasized the importance of introducing the new technologies for promoting the learning among the students. Okay, and then. After the June 2020, you know, after the opening, the op opening, the opening of the schools, about uh, you know half a year, we had uh, kind of stable conditions. But then in 2021, uh, we had a kind of the up down in 20 throughout 2021, particularly first half of 2021, there was uh, you know up and down about the number of uh, people infected with COVID-19. So along with the increase of the infected people, uh, schools sometimes closed and then reopened and then closed and reopened. So uh, it was very tough period for teachers and students and the parents because the parents had to take care of 
uh, kids when schools were closed. So, but there was a clear kind of clear policy shared by shared among the schools uh, during throughout the 2021 or throughout the 2020 and 2021 that we don't want to totally close the schools. So even when the uh, number of people infected with COVID-19 increased, uh, schools were not, not trying to close totally. You know, they, they may close certain classes. Okay, we have many classes and then, so some, some students may be affected, but other students still continue attending the schools. So we try not to really totally close the, uh, close the schools. So that continues uh, up to today. So that's the way we have been adapting for the last two years. You know, in the beginning, we totally closed, the, almost totally closed the schools, but then, we saw that had a too big impact on students and their families and also the schools and teachers. So that was the uh, experience we had uh, throughout the last two years. And then we started uh, observing the impacts of the COVID-19 among the students. For instance, one example is the health conditions. This is a... Uh, uh, you know, results of the uh, physical assessment of the primary school grade five students. Physical assessment uh, uh, requires students to do certain exercise, okay? Uh, they do like sit-ups or uh, jump or they run 50 meters and then, you know, these kind of physical assessment to test uh, about their physical abilities. Then we see the uh, decline of the score of the physical assessment. And we have to carefully examine. Uh, so I should not, uh, uh, I have to be careful as well. But uh, there seems to be uh, some imp influence on the, uh, low, low, the le lowering the level of physical ability among the students. Because uh, Last two years, students had limited opportunities to play sports or do, you know, to play outside because they were kind of encouraged to stay home, okay, many, uh, many hours. So that's uh, say very similar uh, for the uh, secondary school students as well. So, you know, we, we are concerned about the students' health condition. So there are certain uh, challenges, you know, not only the health conditions. So I'd like to share, uh, namely three challenges in today's uh, school education of Japan uh, by facing the influence of the COVID-19. First one is the, uh, you know, uh, delay in the active utilization of uh, information and communication technologies, okay? And 2020, when we first uh, uh, faced the pandemic, the many schools were not so ready to utilize the information and communication technologies to continue teaching and learning, even while the schools were closed. So there was, a, you know, somewhat the gaps we observed between the public schools and the private schools, uh, or schools in the urban areas and schools in the rural areas. The obviously the, you know, the schools in the urban area or the, those private schools have better conditions to shift to the online teaching and learning. While uh, then, you know, we saw some, uh, uh, gaps between. But then the government uh, uh, somehow, you know, I would say luckily the government had the, the uh, policy of so called the Giga School project. And they were planning to introduce more techno uh, information, uh, ICT technology, ICT to the students, and then uh, try to distribute the either tablet or a PC for at least one tablet or a PC for 
each student. So all the students will have uh, at least one tablet or one PC, personal computer, uh, by the middle of 2020. So I mean, by the, so sometime around 2024 or 2025, we were planning to distribute all these uh, uh, yeah, all, all these uh, uh, tablet or PC, but uh, the government decided to, uh, to uh, accelerate the pace of distributing these uh, tablet or PC. So instead of spending five years, you know, they really spend one or less than two years to distribute uh, these things. So by, th by, th by now, actually, at least in, uh, primary and the lower secondary schools, uh, all the students have uh, at least one tablet or one uh, PC. So this really uh, had, you know, the government made a very good efforts to uh, accelerate this project called the uh, Giga School. And in order to respond to the, the, the challenges. And second challenge, this is also about the issue of the uh, inequality among students in adoption of online learnings. And particularly on the family side, because it's not only the uh, tablet or personal computers, you have to have uh, the environment to use. So, for instance, if you don't have enough internet access in your home, you cannot uh, utilize these technologies. Or, you know, when you do the online study, you may need uh, uh, someone to help, particularly for the primary school students. You know, it's very difficult for them to study alone. So some families, they decide to stay parents decided to stay home to help their kids. But then, you know, sometimes they, lose, they have lost jobs because of that. And if you don't want to lose a job, then you have to go to the, the workplace and then you have to leave your students, uh, your kids alone. So this is particularly difficult for the single parent families. Uh, and then we last 10 years, we have been really discussing about uh, the very difficult uh, uh, financial conditions of the single parent families, particularly those headed by a mother. And then this, this issue has been uh, worse, becoming worse than be before due to the, uh, the situation of the introduction of the online learning. So, that was a, a big issue when the schools closed. So that's why the Japanese schools try not to totally close the, close the school. But at the same time, you know, because the pandemic goes up and, uh, up and down, and then when the number of uh, infected people increased, uh, the school had to uh, shift to the online teaching and learning uh, occasionally. So. We are not totally closing schools, but we are still affected. For instance, I have a, a one daughter who is a, a seventh grade, oh, sorry, eighth grade. So she is a second year of the lower secondary school. And last two months, is, uh, she had to stay home for three times. Uh, each time she had to stay home for one week because uh, some of her classmates were infected by the COVID. Then if one or a few students were infected, often the case, they close that classroom. So, uh, you know, this kind of situation continues. And then there's another issue we have to pay attention on. I mean, today we are talking about uh, uh, some, uh, you know, uh, neglect, uh, the, the parental neglect of abuse at home, okay? So some kids were abused by their parents. So schools have been a place for them to be 
safe. But uh, you know, what if they had to stay home? They had very serious conditions. And when we closed the school in the spring of 2020, uh, we closed the school, as I said earlier, you know, we closed the school in April, March, April, and May. Uh, some of the uh, doctors, uh, you know, my, they, they concerned so much that uh, uh, they cannot really find the sign of the uh, parental neglect or abuse to the kids. Because uh, normally when the parents abuse their kids, you know, uh, you cannot really see uh, the sign of, uh, for instance, scars or, uh, you know, uh, because uh, normally that's uh, under the, under the, you know, closes. Parents normally don't hit the faces of the students, but the uh, stomach or, uh, you know, back or, uh, you know, hip or, then, in Japanese schools, uh, every year we have uh, uh, periodical medical examinations. And then normally medical, ex medical examination take place in the beginning of the school year, which means April or May. So this is an occasion for the doctors to check whether students are healthy or students are not abused. But uh, in 2020, the many schools didn't do the medical examination because they were closed. And then also they didn't want to uh, put the students in a small room because to, in order to avoid the pandemic. So the doctors couldn't really check uh, the students' health conditions. That was really a challenge we faced uh, during the, the, you know, the pandemic. And then, Similarly about the health issue, you know, uh, some of the kids are not really having enough dietary uh, food at home because they were neglected. So the school lunch was, uh, you know, kind of a very important occasion of taking uh, the nutrition for such students. But uh, they, you know, when, obviously when schools closed, uh, you know, they didn't have such opportunities. So anyway, so we had uh, some uh, uh, challenges, and but then we are trying to improve the situation as well. So the next, uh, uh, lady introduced a new policy in the late 2020, which is called the Tower of the Construction of Japanese Style School Education in the Era of Leiwa. Le Leiwa is the name of the uh, years today, the name of the uh, emperor. And then, you know, then we try to accelerate the transformation of school education. And then there are a few issues we have been emphasizing, you know, that we really have to make our schools very inclusive and flexible. And then we really need to respond to the individual needs of the students. Like I shared some of the challenges. So, you know, we have a different needs and demands among the students and then we really need to uh, tackle those challenges. And then we want to really collaborate and um, promote collaborative learning as well. Because uh, as I said in the beginning, in Japanese education, we are not only focusing on the academic ability, but we are also uh, focusing on the, you know, cultivating the richness in the mind, mind and then also the healthy uh, bodies, and particularly the cultivating the civic mind. You really have to work with other students together. So the collaborative learning is very important. So although, Sometimes we, you know, although we are promoting the uh, ICT, for instance, uh, in the, our school education, we think, uh, you know, the students should not uh, work alone because when you use these, uh, you know, tablet or personal computers, you tend to work alone and forget to work with other students. But, uh, you know, uh, we really need to promote more collaborative learning. At the same time, in fact, you know, 
uh, we are not that uh, uh, ahead of other OECD countries uh, in terms of using the, these technologies. Uh, these are number of our uh, students use the internet outside the school days, uh, outside the school. And actually Japanese students uh, use less hours for the internet outside school. I mean, the interpretation of this data is actually a bit uh, tricky because uh, longer, hours, longer you use the internet uh, may not be considered better. Okay, so this, this data is a bit tricky to interpret, but the next data is very more important. This is about average length of time that digital devices are used during classroom lessons in a week. And then obviously Japanese schools uh, not uh, uh, use the, these digital devices uh, so frequently. Comparing to many uh, comparing to other OECD countries, this OECD uh, means average our average of the OECD countries. Yeah. So we still have a lot, you know. Although we have promoted the Giga School project and then distributed the digital devices, those you know, a tablet or a personal computers to the to each student, but we still uh, we may not have a. a use the, them in the maximum manner. Uh, there seems to be more uh, challenges for us. And here is uh, some ideas about uh, what will be the Japan school education in the post pandemic. And during the last two years, we have really recognized that uh, uh, Japanese schools and our educational practices are really supported by the communities. But last two years, we had such difficulties to work with uh, local communities because uh, we want the people to stay, uh, keep certain distance, right? And then we try not to invite uh, uh, outsiders to school, local people to school, uh, much less comparing to the before pandemic. And then uh, in the post pandemic, how we could uh, uh, go back to work with uh, local communities. That is uh, really the uh, challenge for us. And another challenge is that uh, the gaps of digital literacy among teachers. You know, some teachers are really uh, using the digital devices uh, quite the uh, uh, effective manner, but uh, some others are not. So we really have to uh, work with uh, teachers to be able to use the ICT in more efficient and effective manners. Okay. And also we have been discussing, I mean, this is uh, more about, uh, probably more about uh, upper secondary and uh, higher education, but uh, we really need to think of the uh, internationalization of Japanese education because, uh, for instance, Giga School project really, you know, uh, made it happen that uh, each student can have uh, digital devices, and then we can be more easily connected to the people outside the country, people in the out outside countries. So we can promote more international practices among our students. But, uh, you know, it depends on the teachers and schools. You know, some teachers are quite active to do that, but some are don't. So how, how we can, you know, uh, work with our overseas partners. I hope we can see more collaboration between Japan and Indonesia in this respect. Also, when we share our experiences or our education models, you know, I, I use the word uh, uh, educational borrowing or, you know, knowledge diplomacy. But uh, how, when we introduce the, our model, how that model be interpreted 
by our foreign partners are not so simple and easy. For instance, you know, I show the, the school cleanup. Now you can find the school cleanup in some countries. You know, this is a photo I took in the Philippines. And, but when I brought the, the uh, when I went to the Singapore, for instance, you know, that this school in Singapore introduced the school cleanup by students. Uh, they, they, you know, kind of uh, follow the, the Japanese practices. And what they are doing, you know, they were cleaning on the table after they had lunch in the canteen. So they clean up, students clean up the table. But on the floors, there were a lot of garbage on the floors. And the students didn't clean the garbage on the floors. I asked the teachers, you know, why, why students don't clean the, you know, the garbage on the floors in the canteen? And then they said, that, you know, this is a job for the uh, janitor. It's not a job for students. And I, I explained, you know, the school cleanup is not the job for students. It's, uh, you know, it's school cleanup is uh, done because uh, uh, we want our students to clean our space, their space, okay? The, the, those classrooms or canteen they use is uh, their own space. So who clean up? They should clean up by themselves. That's the ideas of, the, of promoting school cleanup in Japan. But in some other societies, you know, uh, you have different uh, practices and they different uh, customs. For instance, uh, even at home, you know, uh, you may have uh, uh, someone to clean up. So it's for students raised in that kind of family or student raised in that kind of culture, it's probably very difficult to understand uh, about the meaning of the school cleanup. Or uh, there's another example, you know, when I brought the, the school principal visited from Finland to Japan. And I, we went to schools because they wanted to see how Japanese schools are doing. And then, you know, when the, some of the Finnish principals saw students cleaning the classrooms, they, they started, uh, you know, they, they got angry. You know, because they thought, you know, they, they said this is a, a child labor. Okay, you are you are forcing students that you know the child labor. And then I I explain again, you know, this is not really forcing students to work. You know, this is a, a practice to cultivate a sense of the you know uh, a sense of maintaining the public space, which is used by themselves. But uh, you know, Finnish teachers uh, uh, said uh, if if we, we ask students to clean the class classrooms, that some of the parents will sue the school for such such you know uh, child labor. So it's very difficult to you know uh, share these uh, uh, practices. But at the same time, you know, there's a lot of possibilities to learn each other. So uh, I hope, you know, uh, we can share uh, our ideas, our experiences, you know, and our, uh, and then we, we learn each other too. For instance, you know, I have emphasized that uh, it's academic ability is not only the future, future of the Japanese education. Okay. Uh, we really put a lot of emphasis on the various issues, including the uh, uh, sanitation and the hygiene. That's why we see, we consider school lunch is also very important. And here is uh, some data, uh, quite interesting data that uh, we see uh, in so-called developing countries, you know, uh, more and more kids are uh, becoming fat these days. And then one of the reasons, you know, we see that there's uh, some correlation between the obesity, obesity means becoming very fat 
and then the uh, income gaps. So when the, you know, people, people in a uh, less, more difficult economic, social economic backgrounds, they tend to become fat. And then why this is happening? This is kind of strange because, you know, when we see the obesity become, you know, uh, it's normally the problem of the people who have more money because you eat more. But uh, today we see that uh, uh, people with less money becoming fat because they eat uh, uh, the food, cheap, low cost food, but, uh, you know, having uh, uh, the calories more. So for instance, you know, we call junk food, that types of the food uh, they kind of take. And then why that happens? Because, uh, you know, they don't have uh, enough high health literacy about. So parents don't understand what sort of dietary habit the kids have to do. And in terms of this, as you see here, Japan is the, one of the very uh, exceptional country regarding the issue of obesity. Actually, UN, US, United States is another exception. You know, They have too many people who are having more fat. But then Japan, we have a, probably the least uh, level of uh, obesity around the world. And uh, I have been thinking why this I think, you know, because, because of the health literacy we cultivate throughout the, uh, our school education, as well as home, home education, family education. You know, we also, family also uh, teach about these kind of issues. But at the same time, you know, the school education really plays important roles to, you know, improve the health literacy among the people. And then this is, uh, uh, this was, and this has been, uh, I think, you know, very important uh, under the situation with COVID-19 today as well. So these are the kind of the, you know, uh, impact of the COVID-19 to Japanese education today. And then uh, I'd like to, you know, uh, sum up to discuss about uh, the characteristics of Japanese education. But I have a few more slides. But before moving on, if, if <laughs> there is uh, any question or comments, uh, I really would like to respond at this moment. Is there any or no? Yes, yes, there are uh, several questions. Okay, uh, thank you. You can also open the chat room. If it is in English, maybe you can mm -hmm. uh, answer, but if it is in Indonesian, I can translate. Okay. So oh. we have uh, from, I think from, mm -hmm. Kamen, from the Indonesia Monka Show, I think. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, is this Mr. or Miss uh, Ubay? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, you can, can, uh, can you find it? It is with a K uh, in the chat room. Comment uh, is like. What, can, you, can you tell me the time uh, that person typed? Uh, 2.28. 4.28, okay. 2.28, yes. Uh, two, uh, oh, sorry, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 2.28, yeah, yeah, 2.28, yeah, yeah, <laughs> oh, yes, sorry. Okay, is this the one, uh, Kemendik? Yes, Kemendik but a small bush. Okay, thank you for your insight. And the, the COVID-19 pandemic outbreak has occurred all over the world and has had uh, uh, a lot of impact in all sectors, especially education. This brings an impact on teaching learning process that we call as learning loss, yes. How could Japan deal with this learning loss condition? How does Japanese cope up the economic healing during this pandemic? What is the Japan spirit for international cooperation? Thank you. Thank you very much for very solid questions. And yes, uh, 
as I said earlier, you know, uh, the, in order to respond to the learning loss happened in Japan, uh, one tactic, one strategy is to really uh, promote uh, the Giga School project, which means, you know, uh, distributing the digital device to the students. So one, one, at least one digital device for each student uh, in order to respond to the con uh, case of uh, school closure uh, or class closure. Then uh, that is uh, one thing. And then for instance, uh, uh, the Ministry of Education as well as uh, uh, the Board of Education of many different uh, uh, local governments, they have uh, prepared uh, uh, you know, they, they have supported the, the creation of the online teaching materials. And so this has been really done. That's the one thing. And then also uh, another thing is that, uh, as I mentioned uh, in my uh, lecture, we have, uh, uh, we have reprioritized uh, the contents of the curriculum. So unfortunately, we had to cut some of the special activities and extracurricular activities and then try to secure the teaching and learning hours for main, 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 main subject areas. So that, you know, so sometimes they open school on Saturdays or they shorten the summer and winter breaks. Uh, normally we have like uh, at least uh, five, six weeks for the summer break, but uh, they shortened and then like three, four weeks of the summer break and, to, and then secure the teaching, uh, teaching hours. So that, that was also the, another response to, um, to deal with the, the learning loss. Uh, and there have been uh, various different efforts, but uh, I don't, we, we have not, had uh, uh, clear data yet uh, about uh, the learning loss in Japan. Uh, actually, I was looking for, and I was looking for, and then I could, I could actually find the learning data of the learning loss uh, of the UK. Oops, sorry. This is an interesting data, but uh, we can expect, we can probably uh, imagine kind of similar, but not that uh, severe uh, conditions. This is a case in the UK. And then when they closed the schools for six months, and what happened? The yellow ones, uh, you know, uh, yellow ones are students coming from the low socioeconomic status and the blue one are coming high economic, socioeconomic status. And then obviously students uh, are coming from high, higher socioeconomic status uh, uh, do not uh, fall into the behind so much. While the students coming from the lower socioeconomic status, they really delayed and then in their learning. And then this is the really the learning loss we find. So the learning issue of the, in order to discuss about the issue of learning loss, we have to really uh, pay attention on the gaps and the disparities uh, among the students, okay? So uh, that part uh, in Japan, we have been concerning, but we haven't had enough uh, data yet. Uh, so we started, we started, we have started having such data little by little. Okay, and then uh, economic healing uh, during this pandemic. Yeah, this this one is kind of actually quite interesting because economic economic activities are not uh, have not stopped totally. In fact, some of the sectors are really active. For instance, uh, uh, information technology sectors uh, or that those, you know, those relating to the basic uh, life infrastructures. So actually we see, including Japan, we see many uh, industrialized countries have been increasing, uh, growing our economy to some extent. But again, here is a gap uh, amongst the different sectors. You know, some sectors have been damaged so much and some, are, some don't. So, 
it's it's quite uh, uh, tricky to deal with uh, uh, this uh, issue of the economic healing. So the third one is what is the Japan speed for international cooperation? Yes, as I have been repeating, we really really would like to work with uh, our uh, foreign partners. You know, uh, often the case we use the form of uh, our mode of uh, official development assistance. But Edport Japan is uh, for, uh, probably the quite interesting and unique efforts our government has been making, the Ministry of Education in, especially, because uh, Edport Japan, you know, uh, some projects are supported by the official development assistance, while many projects were supported by the uh, individual companies or in you know, the private sector. So, for instance, I share the two examples. The both examples are done by the companies like Yamaha. So Yamaha spend their money. You know, the ministry don't really doesn't give any money to Yamaha. I mean, very small seed money they provided, but uh, basically they support the project. But uh, they we don't really uh, the government really doesn't provide uh, financial support because uh, for Yamaha, you know, it's a uh, uh, First, uh, they consider that as their uh, corporate social responsibility. But then eventually, if the many schools started introducing the musical instruments in their lessons, that will become the market for them to sell the musical instruments. So, you know, they have both, you know, of course they are the private sector, so they just don't spend money. They to some extent they expect the profit, but at the same time, they are not only doing for profits, you know, they feel this is important. So that's a spirit we share among the different stakeholders in the Japan's international cooperation. You know, we we don't just expect any you know profit, but we want to work together with our partners and then. We really want our partners to improve their educational practices or educational systems. So that's the kind of the spirit. I mean, maybe we are kind of naive on one hand, and then, but uh, as you know, you know, uh, we had um, we had uh, you know terrible histories uh, in the past. Uh, we came to Indonesia as well during the war time, and then you know. Uh, we our educational cooperation really started the you know looking at looking back the history what we had done before and we don't want to repeat that we really want to work as a friend so that's the really the spirit we share so I, I hope you know what I say is clear enough to you but uh, uh, that's the Japan spirit for international cooperation I think I mean. I have been working in this field for uh, more than 30 years, and then I, I can really say that for that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Okay, maybe we can uh, proceed to the second question mm -hmm. uh, about uh, building a right relationship with Japanese people because they are uh, majority shy and just quiet, quiet maybe. <laughs> so how to uh, build a relationship with Japanese people? Ah, <laughs> mm. how to build the relationship? I think Jap yes, Japanese people in general are quite reserved. You know, we are not so good at you know expressing uh, how how we feel. Uh, yeah, so it's it's a very very difficult question in a sense. Okay, maybe uh, we can keep the question. Maybe you can think about it. Maybe you can answer it later. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, but ma maybe uh, mind you that in Indonesia, we also have a lot of culture. So mm -hmm. it is even difficult among us to maybe have communication with other culture, with different yeah. uh, I, culture. At least, uh, you know, uh, with my experience in the past, uh, you know, interacting with uh, my Indonesian friends, uh, we kind of share similar, you know, uh, similar, I mean, similar culture between two countries, you know, we don't, we don't really, try, you know, we don't really want to be 
you know, outspoken, or we don't really want to be really aggressive to insist. You know, we want to be reserved and accept, and then try to promote harmony and the sympathy between. So actually, you don't really have to worry how to build the relationship with Japanese people, because uh, we are quite similar in a sense. Of course, you know, we have differences. I mean, we, we but uh, I, I see more common commonalities between two Indonesian people and the Japanese people. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, is it okay to go on with the questions? Or mm-hmm. yes, are you yes, going please, to, please, please. Oh, is it okay? Okay, yes, so please. we have uh, from SMP. SMP mm-hmm. is uh, Chugako, mm-hmm. uh, uh, two to eight. Maybe you can read the question also here. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I mm-hmm. have a question. Mm-hmm. We have wide problem in learning process because of society economic intake of student uh, mm-hmm. parents does not have an equal understanding mm-hmm. about education mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, where the economic problem mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. during the pandemic uh, cre- uh, mm-hmm. increase. Mm-hmm. So how to deal with this? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, this is not only Indonesia. This is also uh, for Japan as well and then many other countries as well. Uh, the the parents, I mean, the role of parents, I, I have been observing the role of parents is very, very important. And how they understand the, the importance of uh, uh, assuring the educational opportunities for their kids, you know, that, that really affect. And unfortunately, uh, the parents, that, that is the same in Japan, for instance, you know, the parents who do not have enough educational backgrounds do not understand why education is so important. And then that's why, you know, their kids easily drop out from the school or stop studying, right? So, and then this pandemic really uh, accelerated the gaps between, uh, you know, the parents with high consciousness, higher consciousness, and then, lesser consciousness about the importance of education. Because uh, Japan, I mean, for instance, thinking about Japan uh, for last 150 years, one of the very important principles of uh, Japanese public education system is to provide equal educational opportunities to all the students around the, uh, you know, across Japan. So. No matter you were born in urban city or rural areas, you know, basically we have been providing equal uh, quality, same quality of education to the students. I mean, in order to do that, for instance, our national curricula is a, a very detailed, you know, curricula. I mean, curricula has a, uh, various types of curricula you find, you, you, you can find in different countries. And then, I would say Japanese national curriculum is one of the most detailed in terms of the contents. Mm-hmm. Why? Because we want to make sure that the students really study the same things, yeah, no matter where you are. So that can prevent uh, the influence of the family backgrounds to mm-hmm. some extent, right? If students come to school and they study with the textbooks, they can, they can study, okay? <laughs> However, the pandemic was, uh, uh, had a serious problems because uh, students had to stay home to study online. Then, you know, their needs, their, they needed some support from the family to really understand the contents. However, some families do not. So, that's, you know, so responding to the, the uh, questions, uh, we also have uh, the problems with this. I mean, very similar problems you have been facing today. And that is the, you know, difficult uh, uh, aspect of the, this pandemic. Because uh, the country like Japan, which have been putting so much efforts to provide equal educational opportunities, to all the students. The country like that is still facing the problem. So 
I hope uh, you know I can responding to that, that yes. question. Right? So maybe it is um, uh, more maybe worse in Japan because you used to have equal education, but when mm -hmm. a student doesn't come, so the education is not equal anymore. The parents uh, teach yeah, some, <laughs> in their way. Maybe some like. some people really criticize about this. You know, some people are really. I mean, some particular sociologists and economists have been criticizing about this. Uh, widening the gaps, widening uh, gaps among the students. But at the same time, at the same time, as I said uh, in my lecture, we try not to uh, accelerate such, you know, widening of the gaps uh, by securing certain teaching hours and then try not to uh, close the schools totally, you know, try, okay. try to provide a, the opportunities to students as much as we can, you know. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe the uh, further question is related. Mm -hmm. It is asking mm -hmm. about uh, do Japanese school have designed a hybrid class mm -hmm. combination? Mm -hmm. uh, so what subject uh, is, uh, uh, how is it designed? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, actually this, uh, uh, you don't, in the primary and then lower sec, uh, secondary levels, you don't find so many hybrid classes, in fact, you know. They do either online or on-site, okay? The, but some, some classes you see the hybrid, meaning that uh, some students are in the classroom and some are online. Mm -hmm. But that, that's probably uh, not so many. They, they do either way because hybrid is very difficult for teachers yes. to deal. So many more schools uh, practice either online and then or on site. And then about the subjects, uh, actually, you know, all the subjects uh, they do, I mean, if they have to do online, they actually do all the subjects, including the music, uh, art, fine arts. Uh, physical education. Oh, <laughs> that is difficult. Uh, physical education online. I saw my daughter, who is in eighth grade. She was uh, doing some exercise in front of her computer because the teacher was doing uh, uh, on screen. You know, teacher oh. was doing the exercise and the students do the exercise. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So, uh, very minimum of hybrid. It is online yeah. or on site. Online or on site, and then that's—I mean—that's that's a challenge for the university to now. I mean, more and more universities are now trying to provide uh, on-site classes, on-site courses, but uh, at the same time, uh, uh, in the case of universities, uh, students need to uh, travel more longer distance from their home to the university, right? Normally for the primary and secondary levels, students don't have to travel so long. So uh, in case of the universities and the colleges, uh, some students do not want to travel long distance, like one hour or two hours to come to the university. So they want to stay home, mm -hmm. but some student wants to come to the class. So I, I would say uh, more hybrid courses uh, you can find at the university and colleges. But uh, then that's the challenges, you know, they, they really have difficulties to, I mean, I, I try to do that, but uh, I have decided uh, either way. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Maybe we have just the last question, maybe mm -hmm. because of due to the time. Mm -hmm. This is from Undip Rifki Prasetya. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the insightful presentation. So the question is about a theory called the multi-track diplomacy in which they have those agents in diplomatic mm -hmm. school. Mm -hmm. And in this pandemic case, how Japanese government take an action to build relationship in cultural diplomacy through studies. Mm. Uh, uh, with Indonesia mm. and which wow. agents are most effective. Multi-track diplomacy, in which yes. they have those agents in diplomatic school education. In this pandemic case, 
how Japan take an action to build relationship in cultural diplomacy through st studies, which is on the fifth track diplomacy with Indonesia, and which agent are the most effective? Mm. I, I need to understand a little more about this multi track diplomacy. What, mm -hmm. uh, okay, maybe uh, we can uh, have, uh, I mean, uh, Maybe we another question. I, I, yes. I'm, I'm okay. sorry, I cannot probably respond yes. properly uh, for this question. So can, can okay. we... Okay, okay, we can uh, uh, take this question. Maybe Unmas FBA Made. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is: I would like to ask some questions. Mm -hmm. Are there any help for the from the government to facilitate the children to study at home? Mm -hmm. And what's the other one? Is there a standard <laughs> education via online in Japan using a computer Zoom? And then, okay, maybe uh, this question. Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, government to facilitate the. As I said earlier, you know, there is a, at least the government has uh, distributed uh, uh, the, yeah, the uh, digital devices, right? Like a tablet or a PC. So that's, that's the support. That's the biggest support uh, from the government. But uh, uh, some students, for instance, you know, they may not have enough internet access, in internet connections at home. So uh, it's sometimes they receive some support for having the internet connections. Okay. So and then also uh, they are telling the uh, employers uh, for their you know the companies and then those you know employers to let the, their uh, workers to stay home to help students uh, to teach, right? So uh, there are some uh, subsidies to the companies which allow uh, their workers to stay home with their children, but uh, uh, that's probably not very enough, but uh, there, are, there, are, there have been such efforts to help, okay? And then uh, we don't have a, this, uh, you know, online education is uh, very new to uh, Japanese education system. So, to be honest, we haven't really developed any standard for that. Uh, but at least, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are several different uh, uh, online educational programs and uh, online educational, uh, online teaching aid uh, for teachers and students to use. So, for instance, you know, there are some programs have been supported by the government, and also uh, you can you can access to the website and then watch the different lessons, uh, you know, provided. So teachers don't have to teach everything while they are uh, while students stay home. Teachers can tell students uh, which program students should watch. So students watch certain programs, right? Then they have their own online session to discuss about. Uh, in this case, uh, you know, teachers don't really have to teach everything online because you don't have the materials, <laughs> I mean, prepared for the online teaching. So that kind of educational programs uh, are available today. And uh, I see that is quite effective. I mean, because I, I have been observing my daughter again. again you know, <laughs> okay, she thank you very much. These kind of programs. So a lot of video uh, has been made uh, for the mm -hmm. students to be able to watch, not only listening from uh, the teacher. Exactly, exactly. Okay, thank you very much. I think we still have a lot of questions, but because of the time, maybe mm -hmm. we'll just uh, send these questions to you. And maybe later on, you can uh, still communicate through a Center for Japanese Studies, uh, mm -hmm. and we will hand it uh, yes. to the uh, uh, participant. Mm -hmm. So, well, uh, thank you very much. Maybe uh, uh, I will uh, maybe close the session. Uh, I express my gratitude uh, for uh, Professor Kitamura for your kind explanation towards the questions uh, and your uh, lecture, of course. But before closing the session, I would like to ask Ibu Diyah Madubranti, Chief of, of Japanese 
Center for Japanese Studies University of Indonesia to virtually present a certificate uh, to honor Professor Kitamura uh, as our honorable speaker today. Uh, participant may later express feelings by adding a uh, reaction on the Zoom hand claps or heart mark. Please, uh, maybe uh, Julius Sang could uh, present uh, the certificate and Ibu Dia uh, may be ready, maybe. Yes. Yes, I'm ready. Oh, thank you. <laughs> this is uh, this is so nice. Terima kasih. Thank you very much. Yeah. Ibu Dia bisa di close yeah. up mungkin di sini belum kelihatan mungkin Ibu Dia. Bagaimana? Close up. Ah, okay. So we have Ibu Dia and Professor Kitamura. Uh, silakan Ibu Dia mungkin ada hitokoto dozo Ibu Dia. Hi. Very very inspiring us to uh, to learn how to uh, to uh, to learn by online and by uh, by school in uh, offline but very very interesting and all of the participants so many questions I saw but uh, couldn't couldn't answer because the time okay professor Kitamura Yuta certificate of appreciation is awarded to professor Kitamura Yuto as a speaker in the ambassadorial Lectures 10, 10 at 2021-2022. Uh, Japanese education under the influence of COVID-19 possibilities of promoting knowledge diplomacy to share our experience experiences. Tuesday, Friday, 22, 2022, via Zoom. Dia Madu Blanti, Center for Japanese Studies in Indonesia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Terima kasih. Uh, thank you very much for Professor uh, Kitamura and for Ibu Dia. So, uh, before the uh, as we can see, the time is up. Uh, so, we have to end uh, this precious moment. Uh, before I forget, uh, please uh, kindly tolong isi questionnaire uh, dan itu akan menjadi tanda hadir uh, agar bisa kami kirimkan sertifikat. Uh, Bapak, Ibu, dan para mahasiswa sekalian, uh, sampailah kita pada penghubung acara pada hari ini. Finally, I will give a short closing remarks for our lecture today uh, on uh, the education uh, under the influence of COVID-19. Uh, we all know that education is a long-term process uh, with noble but uh, heavy mission and something that we should look at in a comprehensive way. Uh, then uh, the lecture today from Professor Kitamura uh, gave us insight that education is also a dynamic process uh, and also a system. So pandemic uh, COVID-19 already pushed us in uh, drastically uh, to face the changes and enforce us uh, to be more open in the term of technology development. We are forced uh, to suddenly be able to uh, operate Zoom and all those uh, uh, IT uh, and system uh, to provide uh, learning for our students. Uh, we can uh, learn much from Japan, as uh, said that uh, this is sharing, uh, not forcing. So we can take what is suitable for us, uh, and especially what uh, is called tokukatsu. Uh, even uh, Japanese also choose which to do and which to drop in this pandemic situation. So we can learn and uh, imitate, maybe, uh, or maybe make a new system uh, from based on from what we heard today. 
last but not least, in the future, Japan and Indonesia should learn from each other, I think, uh, and working together, collaborating for more uh, higher knowledge. <laughs> for our young generation, uh, it is very important. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kitamura, Mr. Takahashi from the embassy, and all participants. May we meet again in the next serial of the ambassadorial lecture uh, with many more interesting and important topics of Japanese study. Have a good day, stay safe and healthy. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I see the participants are starting to leave the session. Uh...